people like me. You need people like me so you can point your f***ing fingers and say that's the bad guy. The undisputed super featherweight champion of the world, Alicia, the bomb gardener. start with this. It appears that former WBO super lightweight champion Christina Lenardatu is none too pleased with the progression of Alicia Baumgartner's career. She said, I took Alicia Baumgartner's O. I'm her only defeat, like it or not. I will be her nightmare forever. This is how the world works, and I'm the best example for my baby boy and other kids, mothers, women, etc. Some people's success by cheating, some people succeed by inner strength. I don't expect her to be happy. You would have expected that because Alicia tested positive for a banned substance, that the loss would have been overturned, ruled a no contest, like what we saw with Ryan and Devin. But that didn't happen because Alicia was never suspended. Whether you like it or not, she was cleared. She was never penalized. So the victory still stands. And no, I don't expect Christina Lenardatu to be happy about it any more than I expect the boxing community at large to ignore it or forget it. They won't. To some people, it's a stain. A stain that's going to follow Alicia for the rest of her career like it follows a lot of fighters for the rest of their careers. Like Tyson Fury, like Canelo, Oscar Valdez, more recently Ryan Garcia. Just a lot. A long list of fighters. And Alicia is not exempt, nor is she immune, because I see what people say in the comments, in the comments under my videos, on social media. They haven't forgotten. The latest as it pertains to Alicia is that she will defend her undisputed crown against Belgium's former champion Delphine Persoon in late September on the 27th in Fayetteville, Georgia. Baumgartner was last active in July of last year and Pursoon in November of last year. Delphine has seen action in the last 12 months. Alicia hasn't. I think that matters as her performance is going to be under close scrutiny. Not dissimilar from what we saw with Connor Ben. After all that stuff happened and he tested positive and whatever it was, he had two fights in America and both of those fights were under close scrutiny. People noticed he wasn't able to knock those two guys out the way he was knocking people out before he got popped. They still bring it up. People still bring it up that Connor's power doesn't seem to be what it once was. Those same boo birds, those same critics, they're gonna be paying close attention to how Alicia looks with Delphine Pursoon, who historically has always been a handful for everybody that she fights, win or lose. She's 39 years old now, Delphine Pursoon. She's 39, whereas Alicia is 30, but Delphine has seen action in the last 12 months where Alicia, she hasn't. The contrasting styles, the boxer versus the puncher. The pure boxer versus the pressure fighter. This fight has enough nuances in and of itself with the fighters, irrespective of the intangibles like inactivity, that Alicia Baumgartner isn't your run-of-the-mill pure boxer. Unlike a lot of other pure boxers, she can handle herself mid-range to inside and she packs a punch, or at least Historically, she has. She's got power. So the reason a lot of pure boxers don't generate as much pop or have as much power as some other fighters is because they're always on their toes, always on their toes, moving around, and not really sitting on their punches, where Alicia... You know, that applies to Devin Haney, Shakur Stevenson, those guys. They don't generate much power, where Alicia, historically, she does. And on that premise, perhaps that's why she's better mid-range to inside, than those pure boxers are, than most pure boxers are, because she has enough power to land with authority in the pocket and outside the pocket. Where most pure boxers don't generate much power and they're uncomfortable in the pocket. She's not. That's what sets her apart and makes the fight unique. She's not your run-of-the-mill pure boxer, though at the same time, Delphine has the right style for the job. If we're talking about dealing with a pure boxer, Delphine, yeah. her pressure fighting, her volume punching, yeah. her aggression, her spite. More often than not, though not always, no. but more often than not, 
Pressure fighters are a handful for pure boxers because they throw more punches per round. Delphine Pissoon, she can throw punches all night. She can, even at 39 years old. And she's been fighting and she's been winning and even at 39. She hasn't shown any signs of slowing down. She's been staying in character, doing what she does. This is a very intriguing fight. As stated, she's going to be under close scrutiny for this fight because it will be her first fight since the anti-doping fiasco started. People are going to be paying close attention, though where it's going to take place. But yet, Phil Georgia. Is it the main event? Is that going to be a main event unto itself, or is it going to be on the undercard of something else? And on what platform will they air it? Still a lot of questions that need answers. But that's the word around the campfire. The fight's been pushed back from August into late September, and it's supposed to be happening right here in the U.S. of A. We'll see what other information comes out. Elsewhere in the world of boxing, Ryan Garcia is reportedly set to fight in an exhibition this year. Golden Boy Promotions have reportedly given Ryan Garcia permission to fight in an exhibition contest in Japan in December, despite him having received a ban following a positive test for Osterin. Well, Golden Boy might have given him the green light, but has the New York State Athletic Commission given him the green light? How are they going to respond to this news? Does this in any way, shape, or form constitute a violation of his suspension? The basic idea behind the suspension is since you broke the rules, you're not allowed to make any money for the duration of the suspension from professional boxing. But this being an exhibition and not a professional boxing match that counts towards Ryan's record, is it within the rules? Or does it violate them? Does it violate the suspension? I mean, if some promotional outfit out there in Japan wants to give Ryan a boatload of cash to come over to their side and do the waltz with some guy over there. Manny Pacquiao's supposed to be having an exhibition match over there later on this month on the 28th. Risen is at the helm of promotion. You wonder if it's going to be Risen at the helm of promotion for whatever it is they're planning in December. Maybe? It is sort of an affront. It is sort of an affront to the suspension itself because the basic idea behind the suspension is that since you broke the rules, you're not allowed to make no money. No money from the sport of boxing. Technically, he would be making money from an exhibition boxing match. If this goes through, it's another testament to what I told you, that the sport of boxing doesn't know how it wants to feel about fighters who test positive for banned substances. Because in essence, if you let him do this, you're allowing him to skirt around the suspension, skirt around the rules, continue to make money. But no risks at all because it's an exhibition. I don't get the sense that a promotional outfit out there would go as far as flying Ryan Garcia to Japan for peanuts on the dollar. I expect that this is at minimum a seven-figure payday we're talking about. Sends the wrong message. But everything about Ryan Garcia sends the wrong message. I mean, everything, literally everything. Doesn't want to fight for belts, doesn't want to abide by the rules, doesn't want to make weight. Test positive for a banned substance, makes inflammatory comments about several groups on the premise of race and religion. Can't forget about that. And even though he's supposed to be under suspension, he's still going to make money from the sport of boxing, one way, shape, or form or another sends the wrong message it just does it's like there's no suspension at all and who will be opposite the ring ryan garcia for what is this proposed exhibition match somebody from japan maybe will it be streamed on the zone in association with risen via golden boy promotions who are loaning one of their star fighters out loaning out ryan garcia now what's in it for them? The U.S. streaming rights, maybe? Risen does a lot of shows over there in Japan. Very few of them see the light of day here in America. Risen doesn't have a U.S. broadcast partner, but perhaps for this endeavor involving Ryan Garcia, potentially in December, maybe they'll give those streaming rights, the U.S. rights, to Golden Boy to show on the zone. Ryan will have learned nothing from this. I thought he was supposed to be in rehab. Did he check himself in yet? Because that's what he said via his own social media, that he would be checking himself into rehab. He's got a problem, issues with his ex, his baby mother. All that stuff. And he will return from this emboldened by the fact that even though he was under suspension, he still found a way to make money. So his behaviors 
would be likely to continue in that scenario may have had to forfeit his fight purse to Golden Boy and pay a $10,000 fine to the New York State Athletic Commission, but he's gonna make all of that back in Japan. Might make more than that depending on what they pay him to fly out there, like I said. I don't imagine they fly him to Japan for peanuts on a dollar. They're gonna pay him well. And the New York State Athletic Commission? We haven't heard anything yet from them as far as what their stance is on Ryan participating in an exhibition match. I don't even know that you need a boxing license, an official boxing license to participate in an exhibition, a little waltz. But don't those uh, social media influencers have to get boxing licenses? I remember hearing that there is a commission that oversees those social media fights in the UK. They've got a, a commission that oversees all of that. Yeah, but that's because those fights count towards their professional records. This doesn't. This doesn't count towards Ryan's pro record if it's an exhibition. And who says it's boxing? It might not be. Maybe it's some kind of hybrid MMA boxing thing. Maybe they're gonna lather Ryan up in a tub of mayonnaise and have him wrestle a dolphin. I don't know. But Ryan's back in the news. He's back. Well, technically, he never left. In men's junior middleweight news, former champion Tim Zhu outlines his 20 steps forward plan after upset loss. Tim Zhu doesn't like waiting around, but that's what he's been forced to do primarily because of the grisly cut he sustained on his forehead during his March 30th bout versus Sebastian Fundora. Zhu has been on the mend following the split decision loss to Fundora, taking the time to reflect as he looks towards the future. This year has been a whirlwind. It began with the former WBO 154 pound champion slated to face veteran Keith Thurman in the headlining event of the PBC's first card with new broadcast partner Prime Video. When Thurman pulled out with a bicep injury, Fundora stepped in on an 11 days notice and the WBC threw their vacant junior middleweight belt into the mix to make it a unification match. And that never made sense to me. I don't want to be long-winded, but it never made sense for Tim Zhu, who's a star in his own neck of the woods, to come all the way here for Keith Thurman. That would be tantamount to either Fraser Clark or Fabio Wortley coming to America for Charles Martin. Doesn't make sense. As they have more of a following in the UK than he has in the US, the same applies to Tim Zhu. Tim has more of a following in Australia than Keith has in America, so why come here? Doesn't make sense. I know what I possess, and I knew that I could get the job done, and I could adapt, said Zhu. It's hard because you think about when you're fighting an opponent, you're like, this is the man you're fighting, and then it's a complete switch. It took me two days to process it, and I said, all right, the fight's not over. We've got a new challenge, and that's it. And then I was locked in sparring, and I felt good. Eric from Las Vegas and the boys got it done with the sparring and southpaws. The show went on, and the rest is history. Early on, Zhu looked to be on his way to victory, snapping the six foot five Fundora's head back with right hands. That changed late in the second round when an accidental elbow from Fundora opened a deep gash on Zhu's forehead. It was the kind of gruesome injury that typically cuts a fight short. Zhu refused to quit. The Australian doggedly pressed forward, but with the blood constantly obstructing his vision, Fundora was able to land with greater frequency as the fight progressed. Fighting with a sense of urgency, Zhu rallied late. Both warriors wore battle scars at the end of the thrilling encounter. But I'll tell you that that didn't have to happen. And I still think they were setting Tim Zhu up. It's all too convenient, too familiar. How Errol Spence Jr. was supposed to fight Manny Pacquiao. And then at the very last minute, they swap him out for Jordanis Ugas. Manny was training for a southpaw who likes to fight in the pocket. He ends up with an orthodox fighter who likes to move and punch. Kinda like how Tim Zhu was training for a naturally smaller man who likes to move around, leads with the left hand. He ends up with a bigger man who leads with the right. It seems deliberate. I felt in control, you know, and in the zone, and everything was going well, Zhu recalled. Then I guess the cut sort of threw me off and I just wasn't able to adapt. In my eyes, I could have done better. I still believe I could have knocked him out. He's an awkward opponent, a tall southpaw. It's tough when you've got a reach like that, but I think he knew as soon as he felt my power that he couldn't engage, so he had to just play it smart. And he did. Where normally Sebastian Fundora likes to fight in the pocket, he used his height and used his length to keep Tim at arm's length. Zhu, 29, hoped for a quick recovery and return. That hasn't been the case. A proposed August 3rd match 
versus unbeaten rising star Virgil Ortiz was canceled on the advice of Zhu's doctor, who said he wasn't ready to resume full contact sparring due to the cut he suffered against Fundora. Yeah, it's a weird feeling. You've always got like a date to work towards and a goal, said Zhu. But yeah, it's not been as intense. Just a bit of relaxation mentally. But at that time for me, I need that. I need to feel that pressure. I need that date just to be able to say I've got something locked in and I'm ready to go. But you've got to be able to balance things out. And even though I don't have a date, I'm still growing, still finding ways to level up in every way I know. Zhu will return to the US in the coming days with an announcement of his next fight imminent. I'm still working towards something, so hopefully, fingers crossed, we get something locked in in the next few weeks. Whomever he faces will be dealing with a Zhu who has taken his loss as a lesson to be applied going forward. You don't win everything in life, you know, said Zhu. That's what I realized. One thing I thought about was that in my eyes, I was never too happy with a win anyway, so when I lost, I didn't get too sad either. I always had a fear of losing. Once I felt that, I knew that it was going to bring up a lot of growth. When you take two steps backwards, you're going to leap another 20 steps forward. So that's the mind frame. I'm coming for it all now, man. He's got the right attitude. They say he's coming to America with an announcement imminent. Rumor has it the announcement may come to us this Thursday, there is already talk about an August show where Caleb Plant will be fighting Trevor McCombie, uh, former champion Stefan Fulton, he'll be fighting Ronnie Rios, and you wonder if Tim Zhu won't be a part of that show. That show in August? It's cutting it close, ain't it? I heard a rumor that he may be facing Abel Ramos. That's not exactly an easy fight or a rebound fight. That's a full-on contest, a full-on fight, but... That's how Tim Zhu likes it. We'll see if that's who he ends up fighting. But my honest opinion, it's counterintuitive to keep fighting here. It doesn't make sense. You're already a draw where you're from, and the people that they're flying you out to fight aren't the kind of people that you fly out to fight. They're not. Terrell Gachet in Minneapolis? Keith Thurman in Las Vegas? Subsequently, Sebastian Fundora in Las Vegas, and now potentially... Abel Ramos. None of these guys have the following here in the United States that Tim has in Australia. So what are you doing? Stupid. He shouldn't be fighting here. That unless it's for a, a Terence Crawford or a Virgil Ortiz for big money. It doesn't make sense to fight in America and I hope that he doesn't. But they say he's set to come here to make his next fight announcement. The ideal opponent would be IBF champion Bakram Murtazalia, who I think... Tim Zhu can beat. And then afterwards, the winner of Fundora versus Spence. If and when that happens, that would be the ideal run of fights for Tim Zhu. But that's just me bouncing ideas around. He still seems to be affiliated with the PBC, and I don't know why, because they're not doing anything for him. You originally aligned yourself with these people for a Charlo fight, and you never got it. I'm of the opinion they've been trying to set him up the whole time he's aligned himself with them, and it finally blew up in his face. He's a great fighter. I still think he's a great fighter, but he can't see the forest through the trees. Just wonder who he's gonna fight next.